thank you for taking the time to join us. Um, you know, this is a really important uh, conversation in this forum with the candidates for California's 10th Senate District. I am Regina Celestin Williams. I'm the executive director of SB at Home and the SB at Home Action Fund. And we are so proud to be hosting this forum with you this evening. Um, before we begin, I'd like to just take a moment to thank our co-hosts. Uh, we're truly honored to be in solidarity tonight with uh, the co-hosts and these amazing partners, uh, the Black Leadership Kitchen Cabinet, the Billy D. Frank LGBTQ Plus Community Center, California Yimby, Destination Home, East Bay for Everyone, East Bay Yimby, Fremont for Everyone, uh, the Greenbelt Alliance, Housing Choices, the Law Foundation of Silicon Valley, Lead Filipino, Livable Sunnyvale, Momenta for Health, the San Jose Silicon Valley NAACP, Silicon Valley Community Foundation, Silicon Valley Council of Nonprofits, South Bay Yimby, Student Homeless Alliance, Streets for People, Tech Equity Action, United Way Bay Area, Urban Environmentalists, the Vietnamese American Roundtable, and Yimby Action. Wow, we're just so honored again uh, that they uh, allowed us to really partner with them in this effort to bring this candidate discussion to you all. So now it's my pleasure um, to get this underway and to introduce our moderator for tonight's forum, Devin Feely. Devin is an Emmy award-winning reporter with KPIX Channel 5 CBS. He is a San Jose native and a resident. So Devin, I turn it over to you. Thank you for being with us tonight. All right, I remember to unmute myself. So I, I have avoided that technical pitfall right off of jump. Yeah, my name is Devin Feely. I've been with KPIX5 uh, CBS for seven years now, reporting and, and anchoring their weekend morning shows. And I wanted to thank you guys for inviting me today. Uh, tonight, we are honored to be joined by four candidates from the California State Senate District 10. The incumbent has turned out, has termed out and the lines of this district have shifted a little bit. The district spans two counties. It spans both northeastern Santa Clara County and southern Alameda County. Our candidates tonight are Jim Canova, Jamal Khan, Lily May, Aisha Wahab. Now, we've got a few rules, not too many, and they're pretty basic. I think really sort of at the top of the list is just basic civility and courtesy while we're on this uh, call tonight. Um, we will hear an opening statement from each of the candidates. Then we're going to move on to two Q&A sessions, one where they will be able to give 90 second answers to each question, and then one rapid fire before we close everything out. Now, the candidates did get a chance to look at the questions ahead of time. And this is really less a debate, more a discussion and a forum. And so we really ask all of the candidates to answer the question specifically highlighting their experience, their perspective, their accomplishments. What would they do if they were put into a position of authority where they could make decisions about policy, about spending priorities? Um, and we ask that you not really refer to other candidates and certainly not uh, you know, disparage or attack other candidates because there will be no rebuttal. This is an opportunity for voters to have an, a, a chance to listen to your ideas, your platform, and your perspective. Um, so we've asked the candidates to keep comments focused on the issues, the job, the district, themselves, their experience, their approach, and ideas. And each will have an opportunity to answer all of the questions. So we're gonna begin with the candidate statements. So why don't we just begin, I'll go in alphabetical order initially, and I'm gonna randomize the responses to, to the individual questions. But let's go ahead and start with Jim Canova. Thank you, Devin. And I really appreciate being invited to, to tonight's forum. Uh, California's future depends upon the success of our families. Now, increasingly, our families are no longer able to afford to live in California. As your state senator, I will fight to preserve and expand family-friendly, affordable housing. My name is Jim Canova, and it's time for a new California dream. We love that brevity, 
less than uh, less than the one minute allotted to each to each candidate. Let's go now to Jamal Khan for your one minute statement. Uh, thank you, Devin. Uh, my name is Jamal Khan, and I grew up right here in the district and attended local public K through 12 schools. I'm a Berkeley and Harvard Law graduate, and I've worked for Nancy Pelosi, Kamala Harris, and the Obama White House. I've also worked for Catherine Cortez Masto, who is now the first Latina U.S. Senator in American history. For the Obama White House, I worked on a number of administration priorities, including promoting the clean power plan to reduce carbon emissions from power plants, raising the minimum wage, paid sick and family leave, voting rights, LGBTQ rights, gun violence prevention, tuition-free community college, universal pre-K, and the opioid crisis. And some of the items in my policy portfolio at that time are also prior priorities in my policy platform right now for state Senate. Uh, but my top two priorities are affordable housing and homelessness, which are somewhat interrelated. And everything revolves around one main goal, which is fighting to live on working class until it is once again an inspiration for the world. Thank you. All right, fantastic. And I will give gentle reminders once we, once we kind of pivot into the Q&A portion. When you have about 15 seconds left, I will just gently remind 15 that will allow you to kind of naturally wrap up whatever you're saying at that, at that moment. Let's go to our third candidate tonight, Lily May. Sorry, good evening. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity to join all of you. I'm having lots of fun with technical difficulties. Um, I wanted to share the importance of this topic. I certainly recognize that housing can be a real challenge. I still remember moving here as a young couple and having student loans and trying to afford that first apartment as well as looking for our first house. I know how difficult and challenging it can be is as a family to raise a family and choose Silicon Valley as a place to call home. And now, as I am now qualified for senior or qualifying for senior housing, looking at the breadth and uh, scope of the needs for this type of service. Never before in these types of pandemics have we realized how important it is to provide all these different types of services, whether it's for rental assistance or for eviction moratoriums. And these are some of the conversations that I look forward to having with you today about how we can take things, not just from a city level, but to scale it on regional and statewide to deliver the services. Thank you. All right, and certainly last but not least, we have Aisha Wahab. Thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak on housing. To me, this has been the most important issue for so many uh, personally, as well as across the district. Um, I'm a kid that grew up in foster care and relied on the community and want to serve the community. My name is Aisha Wahab. I'm a Hayward City Council member, and I'm running for state Senate. I do have the endorsement of the current sitting uh, senator, Senator Bob Wykowski as well as the California Democratic Party and uh, Working Families Party uh, and many other housing advocates across this uh, district. I'm hoping to earn your vote. And I will state that um, for me, I sit on the Homeless and Housing Task Force in Hayward. Uh, housing has been my number one priority and continues to be because we all deserve a place to live and be sheltered and be safe. Thank you. All right, thank you. So let's go ahead and uh, transition now to the, to the Q&A portion. The first question is, the State Department of Housing and Community Development recently released a new statewide housing plan that calls for the development of 2.5 million new homes by the end of the decade, including 1 million affordable homes. Now, currently the state is falling woefully short of that goal. At the current rate, fewer than 600,000 units are projected. As a state legislator, what actions would you take to help us collectively reach that goal? Why don't we start with Mr. Khan? Uh, Mr. Khan, this question is yours. Oh, okay, sure. Um, okay, so the first thing is to uh, that I would do would be to help remove artificial barriers to housing construction. So I will uh, enable local elected officials to judiciously cut through the thicket of government regulations that unnecessarily restrict the speedy construction of new housing. And I'm looking at the California Environmental Quality Act. Uh, it, there were good intentions behind it. It was intended to balance the societal benefit of construction projects with their environmental impact. 
but it's been hijacked by special interest groups to artificially restrict the supply of housing. And so my plan will provide waivers for uh, CEQA approval to expedite shovels in the ground. Uh, I'm also going to work on incentivizing developers to build more affordable housing. So most cities in our district impose in lieu fees on developers who don't include an, an, enough affordable housing units in their building projects. And the fees are deposited into a dedicated account that can only be attacked, uh, tapped for affordable housing projects. And so I will work with municipalities in the district to take a closer look at their in lieu fees so that incentives are aligned toward the construction of more affordable housing units, not less. And uh, last but not least, I'm going to focus on incentivizing dense mixed use housing near public transit. So this approach has the advantage of increasing the supply of housing while mitigating concerns about aggravating you know, traffic congestion, air pollution. I had stints in the Boston area and in Washington, D.C. for several years, and I was amazed by how easy it was to get around without needing a car. And in fact, Sorry, it was actually that more is of that is, I don't mean to interrupt, but that is time. We're going to try and keep everyone to 90 seconds. I will give you that 15 second reminder just, just to help. Um, so same question, Lily May. Sure. So good evening, everyone. As one of the cities that have met the residential housing needs assessment and having served as a city council member, I participate in the process of engaging our community when we look at the general plan uh, for our cities, but more importantly, I think that it's also working with our legislators and with fellow cities. In fact, earlier today, I, I sit on Housing Economic Development League of California Cities, where I work with many fellow municipalities when we look at how we address housing. And some of the things that we've been able to look at is not just in terms of the cost of housing, but how we can advocate for our voices, whether it's going up to Sacramento or working at the federal level to request some of these additional fundings or advocating for fundings like, for example, right now with Project Home Key. You may have seen today in the news for Oakland that they were awarded that project. Fremont, along with the fellow cities and the Alameda County mayors, where I serve as the conference's vice president, is sending out letters that are asking for this. We've seen in a Turner report that came out recently from UC Berkeley that some of these options are ways to help us shortcut the costs because it's not just for a city council or to decide on land use or entitlement of a project. It's also the other pieces that cost such as the time for the funding to cobble together, material costs and labor costs. So there's different prongs that we have to approach on this, whether it's working with our labor and union on workforce development, or also working on different financing plans and looking at some of the senators' advocacy roles. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, next, let's go ahead and same question to Aisha Wahab. Thank you. Um, the reason why I'm running is actually to tackle our housing crisis. So the problem has historically been that historical patterns of segregation and exclusion, it has been mentioned actually in the statewide housing plan as well. Um, there are many cities that have not updated their housing element, nor have they um, updated the language around it and enforcing some of these uh, efforts on new developments and specifically older developments. Um, so I do want to kind of um, strike that out in a lot of the cities, and I think we can do that through a statewide policy. I also think that there's a lot of varied regulatory hurdles. Um, it's not consistent. Um, each city is very, very different. Uh, there is a sense of nimbyism. There are some cities that are far more affluent that want zero uh, housing, let alone affordable housing. That is a problem, and that needs to be addressed as well. Um, there's also limited federal support as well as funding. Um, so that is something that we need to prioritize. Um, and the high cost of developing housing in particular, now with supply chain issues and, and so much more. We also have insufficient land zone for housing, specifically, you know, people always talk about uh, transit oriented, but to, to be quite frank, um, we don't have a good transportation system in California, you know, statewide, we know that we can work from home, we know we can um, move further out and uh, yet people still come to the Bay Area in these metro areas to work. So Ten seconds. I, I do wanna focus on that and all development should require affordable housing, period. There should not be a in lieu fee payment or anything to escape the responsibility to create affordable housing. Thank you so much. All right, same question. First question to Jim Canova. Yeah, and as many of uh, the other candidates have alluded to, uh, cities take different approaches, counties take different approaches, and, and a problem that we have is there's not integration in our efforts. Our efforts really need to be integrated, and we're talking about 
in, in the case of the office that we're seeking here, the state Senate, what can the state do? What can Sacramento do? Uh, one thing that I would put out there when you talk to developers and ask them what would, what would they prefer to happen to increase housing stock, they typically will say they want the permit process to be faster. Uh, right now, uh, the Silicon Valley Leadership Group is supporting AB 2234. It's a modest proposal, but I think it's a move in the right direction. So that's one point that I would make that we do, when developers tell us they need this to be faster and more efficient to deliver housing stock, we should listen. And then the other thing I would say, we really need to take this beyond local government. Uh, this is really overwhelming for local government. Uh, academic research going back to the economist Milton Friedman suggested additional resources made available to individuals goes a long way towards solving problems. So with only 20 seconds left, what I would like to see if I'm in the state Senate, I would like to do research and move forward towards establishing a, a basically a housing voucher statewide that would help uh, families across the state be able to stabilize their housing, and in some cases, move into owning housing. All right, thank you so much. We move on to question number two. California has a critical need for more housing at all income levels, but the challenge is really the greatest for affordable housing. In Santa Clara County, a family can earn 50,000 a year and still be considered extremely low income. And we all know that there are a lot of folks with fixed incomes, including seniors and people with disabilities, who earn even below that, struggling just to afford rent. What state actions do you think are needed to produce more housing that is affordable to lower income residents, especially those who, learn, who earn less than 30% of the area median income? Why don't we start this time with Lily May? Sure. So as I referenced earlier, one of the things that I'm very proud of is our city's record. And I think that can be translated to other cities and throughout the state of California. We've made a lot of efforts to provide housing with low income and looking at different types of housing, whether it's affordable by design or senior housing or transit or investment. One of the other areas is, as I mentioned before, Project Home Key. And the reason why it's a little bit less expensive is that it uses a fixed infrastructure that already exists a structure that can be remodeled and reduced in terms of the timing. Because one of the biggest factor when it comes to financing is the timing that it takes to cobble. We all know the material costs have increased because of wildfires and other pieces, but it's those types of areas. Another thing I would support is efforts like, I know Senator Caballero is introducing a bill right now on SB 1410. And when you look at different things and you work together collectively with your fellow legislators, you look at ways that you can support ways to prevent unnecessary regulatory burdens. And some of the things that we've been measuring in these time periods include the costs that are impacted by vehicle miles traveled. But those costs sometimes become then translated into costs to the home builders as well as then translated to the buyers. So we have to look at different ways to analyze that to reduce unnecessary uh, burdens in terms of regulatory impacts. And so that's one of the things I think is important. Um, I think it's important for us to also author letters and to ask for construction to be able to be affordable, to have down payment assistance and have investment in programs that will make it easier for people to have home ownership. Thank you. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. Aisha Wahab, same question. Thank you. You know, uh, I'm very much a doer and on the Homeless and Housing Task Force, we have uh, done significant work in Hayward. In particular, I wanna really address this. Cities are inherently invested in creating above market rate housing because the property tax that they receive on above market rate house um, basically creates more tax revenue to the city. So they are naturally inclined to create more housing uh, that's above market rate, number one. Number two is developers are also inherently uh, interested in higher priced homes because at the end of the day, they're trying to earn a profit. Um, I'd push for all new developments to have affordable units. That affordability needs to also be based on the median income levels of the regions. You know, $50,000 to your point in Santa Clara County uh, doesn't take you that far. Uh, $50,000 in the Central Valley or extremely northern uh, part of California may take you that uh, a little bit further. So um, I really want to consider that. Also updating the language as to what is affordable. Uh, we need to include middle income earners. Those are people like myself that have been working, that are squeezed by student loans, by housing, by taking care of their families, uh, and much more. 
uh, we're not really expanding that. You know, people are playing this hot potato of who's responsible for housing and what are some of the other efforts. Um, the honest truth is that we need to kind of just put it out flat. We need to develop this. It has to be part of every single new development. And we won't waste time uh, with collecting in lieu fees and, and all the other things. So I really just want to highlight that we just need to make the rule and make it very clear to everybody that affordable housing is being built uh, regardless of what type of project. All right, same question to Jim. Yeah, and I served on a Santa Clara Unified School District for over 29 years. And we see many projects come through because it has an impact on your district in terms of student enrollment and so on. First point I wanna make very quickly is across Silicon Valley, across the Bay Area, student enrollment is declining. Families are leaving the Bay Area. They can't afford to be here. So when we see community uh, development come our way, uh, the percentage that's affordable is always a very small slice and it's simply not enough. So with the minute I have left, what I'd like to put focus on is the importance and the impact of preserving existing affordable housing. I live in such a community. I live in a manufactured home community. And it's actually been chronicled by the award-winning Mercury News writer, Lou Hansen, since the early days of the pandemic, he's been following our community story. But in, uh, in the early days of the pandemic, we were threatened with losing our homes, nearly 800 families. I was uh, so impressed with my community because they went down to City Hall, San Jose City Hall, and uh, in the early days of the pandemic, and they not only protected their own community, but they protected all 58 manufactured home communities across San Jose. The mayor and the city council unanimous, unanimously changed the zoning to mobile home use only. In that one vote, the city saved over 34,000 citizens' homes. So I really, with my 10 seconds remaining, Preserving existing affordable housing is critical. And later on, I hope to get into COPE and their work and their effort because it's along the same lines. All right, uh, same question, Jamal Khan. Uh, sure. So the very first thing that I'll do if I'm elected uh, for this issue of affordable housing is that I will introduce legislation that imposes restrictions on greedy opportunistic companies such as Blackstone that outbid working families for hundreds of residential homes with all cash payments and then rent them out at a fat profit, which deprives hardworking Bay Area families of the dream of home ownership. I will do everything that is constitutionally allowed to put a stop to that. And now when it comes to additional steps, I will support legislation to incentivize the installation of accessory dwelling units or in-law units to increase the available supply of housing. And I will also reduce unnecessary regulations on their construction. Uh, also, when it comes to going beyond SB9, uh, San Jose is considering a proposal that would go beyond SB9 and put an end to single family zoning restrictions in historic districts. Right now, there's, a, there's an exception for that in the state law. And so uh, San Jose wants to just do away with that. Another proposal would go beyond duplexes and allow for you know, triplexes, fourplexes, and if these proposals pass in San Jose, then I will closely monitor the effects to determine if similar legislation should be introduced at the state level. So there's plenty that we can do uh, to, to make a difference here. And All I right. also wanted to add that uh, I'm happy that the West Winds situation uh, turned out in, for, for a positive outcome. All right, thank you. We're gonna go ahead and go to question number three. So in the past year, there has been a growing tension between the powers of the state and local governments to control land use and zoning. Before recent laws went into effect, cities basically had absolute control, and that resulted in arguably the worst housing shortages in the nation, exacerbating homelessness, segregation, and urban sprawl. What do you think is the right balance between state standards and local control in land, in land use regulation. So this time, let's go ahead and start with Aisha. Thank you. Um, as stated earlier, there are natural um, incentives for the city to do uh, you know, what's best for the city, and that's usually property taxes and so much more. Um, there's a lot of groups that advocate for uh, local control. However, there are certain things that we should allow the city to make decisions. You know, When people um, are talking about um, you know, housing in a city, one, people are concerned about traffic, and that's a legitimate concern. 
People are concerned about the population increase and how it affects schools. People are concerned about um, the quality of life of you know, so many other things. And there is a reason to talk about local control. Um, at the same time, as I mentioned, we do not need to continue to focus on just transit oriented development if we do not invest in transit. So one of the considerations that I feel needs to be made is that as we are investing in more creation of housing and affordability and much more, we need to think about 10, 20, 30 years down the road and not just in the next five years with Band-Aid solutions. Um, the honest truth is California as a whole needs an infrastructure overhaul. We need to kind of understand that I was priced out in Fremont. I could have moved to, to Tracy where so many uh, Bay Area residents moved. Tracy has grown as a city. It's an economic powerhouse now on its own. And we need to understand that, you know, things are changing. And when we talk about uh, development in these cities, it's infill development, which is, you know, raises a lot of concern. So there has to be a balance. There has to be some uh, collective responsibility that we need to build affordable housing, but also need to do it in a very cautious and responsible way. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jim Canovan. Yeah, and there's so many things here, and I know your question is to the state versus local government. So I'll start off from that place, going back to my suggestion of a housing voucher. Uh, we should bypass local government. We should put the resources in the hands of individuals and California families to stabilize their housing as they choose or to move into home ownership as they choose. Uh, one point that I want to make is that renting is fundamentally insecure housing for obvious reasons. We need to promote more home ownership across the state to secure housing for California's families in the future. Uh, also going to the high density construction that we have, I live in North San Jose, this is a first street corridor. Uh, we have, we've had many high tech campuses for many, many years, but with the pandemic, um, many companies now, they have a new business model where people work three days a week, work from home two days a week. There's no, there's nothing attractive about renting a $5,000 a month studio apartment in North San Jose when you can purchase a home in Sacramento, come here as you need to, and that's exactly what's happening. Those empty campuses, and there's many high-tech campuses around me that are empty, are opportunities to build the kind of housing we need, and it has to be family friendly. I can't emphasize that enough. Look at the student enrollment across the Bay Area and across Silicon Valley. We're losing our students, we're losing our families, and that's our future. We better get a handle on this. All right, thank you. Uh, Jamal Khan, you're next. You know, one of my majors in, economic, in, in college was economics, and there's something called a collective action problem where the incentives for individual actors don't line up with what's best for the collective as a whole. And cities will naturally be biased toward having more land that's zoned as business rather than residential. And that's because business zoning brings in plenty of tax revenue for the city, and it doesn't carry the same high cost for public services like you know, schools, parks, libraries, and so on. And some of the cities that have benefited the most from this imbalance are precisely those cities that are dead set against SB9 and the other reforms. And they're searching for all kinds of loopholes. And in some cases, they're digging in their heels and they're openly violating state law. Now, we know that any state law, assuming it's constitutionally valid, will always supersede a municipal ordinance. And this situation is an interesting reversal from what I saw when I was working for the Obama White House, where we would see blue cities in red states that would try to raise their minimum wage, and then Republican lawmakers in the state capitol would introduce preemption bills to stop them from doing that. Uh, but in this case, it's the state that's pushing for a more progressive outcome, and it's the individual cities that are taking on a more self-interested view. And I've made it very clear which side I'm on. And it kind of reminds me of like with you know mental health parity, that the laws that required parity between insurance coverage for physical health and mental health treatment, they were routinely violated. Yes, and so Senate, State Senator Jim Bell introduced a bill that to enforce these laws that were already on the books. And so we'll have to need, a, a, like a, we'll need a similar kind of enforcement mechanism here. All right, thank you, Lily May. Same question. I think I have a unique perspective having served in many of these different roles, having lived in the community, raised a family, been on school board, 
and a city council and mayor and literally having built my city. I know when we talked about getting people out there is to understand the need for housing and I'm proud to have worked eight days on Habitat for Humanity projects in our community doing workforce development and creating that mid missing middle in terms of housing. But I also appreciate the fact that I have the support of all the mayors and most of the council members and planning members in the district because I've worked alongside them, whether it's on the general plan, on the housing element updates, or on how we address the, the key infrastructure that is needed within our community, such as the balance for the quality of life, for transportation infrastructure. One of the key areas is, for example, uh, earlier today, I was on a conversation with realtors talking about um, how we are trying to look at the housing impacts and affordability and diversity and equity inclusion. And we talked about the transit oriented development, how sometimes it's a challenge unless we have that access. So making those collective projects such as the Mission Corridor, which has now helped create housing along Hayward, along that corridor, and you're seeing a lot of that revitalization of that district, that will then translate into the other areas. And then connectivity, for example, on the BART, which connects from Fremont, which was the end of the line, to Milpitas, Warm Springs. So it's that collective impact and creating the quality of life that balances it, having brand new schools, having brand new parks and those bike lanes and other amenities that I think make people choose to make this area your home. All right, thank you. Now, I will say just uh, just your volume was a little bit low. We could hear you, but we had to we had to listen very closely. So that may be something for the next question as we come around that you may just want to, to uh, take a second to maybe troubleshoot. I'm not exactly sure why that happened. But moving on to our fourth question, and Jim, this one's going to go to you. So more attention has been focused recently on recognizing and addressing historic and ongoing systemic racism throughout our society. In housing, we see harmful effects of past and current policies, including segregation, limited housing choices, and a general lack of opportunity. And all of that disproportionately impacts people of color. As a legislator, how will you work to reform California's housing policies in order to dismantle segregation, center racial equity, and close the racial wealth gap? Well, and it goes back to the state versus the local governments, doesn't it? You know, but uh, I, I think that Sacramento can do a lot uh, in that area. Uh, when uh, cities and local government are not doing things as they should, there should be penalties associated with it. Um, in terms of communities of color, in terms of diverse com communities such as my own, it, it's whenever a developer comes in and wipes out an existing neighborhood that's affordable, it's always impacting um, working people. It's working families, uh, uh, families of color. Uh, our neighborhood is very diverse. Uh, we have teachers, uh, food service workers. Um, I have a small business. I'm, I'm not a wealthy man. I serve on a school board. I have a small business. Um, if I lost my home here, I could not stay in Silicon Valley. I'd have to leave. But, but whenever you see these expensive developments come into a particular area, it's always those kinds of vulnerable communities that fall prey. And they need to be protected. Um, in our case, in my community's case, the city stepped up to the plate. They changed the zoning and they shielded us in all 58 manufactured home communities across San Jose, as I mentioned, that, that impacts 34,000 people. That's huge. Um, I'm very supportive of, um, there's a group that I'm excited about, but the Community Opportunity to Purchase Act. What we're, our community is trying to do is establish a co-op, and I see I got 10 seconds left, where we will collectively together own the land under our homes and secure that home, our homes. Uh, COPE is something that I also really am attracted to. I think that it's... Uh, COPA is an opportunity to do the same thing as what a co-op would do for our community and ICM over time. Thank you so much for policing yourself. Uh, Jamal Khan, same question, uh, now to you. Uh, a natural experiment has taken place with my campaign. Uh, I have put my personal phone number out there very publicly. And as a result, I've gotten some very interesting phone calls and text messages. And on a regular basis on the campaign trail, I have been called the N-word because I have a first name that is associated with the African-American community. So that's given me a small but unforgettable taste of what it's like to be Black in America, even here in progressive Silicon Valley. And I know that there's a lot more racism that shows up in ways that are much more subtle, right? 
we need to remember that many of the zoning laws that have been in place for decades were originally designed precisely to favor certain groups over others. And those who were cut off from the dream of home ownership were disproportionately persons of color. And it goes even deeper than that. There was an investigation that found that property tax assessments were more favorable in neighborhoods with fewer racial minorities and less favorable in neighborhoods with a greater concentration of racial minorities. So it even extended to things like property taxes. And similarly, you know, when we look at the closure of some of these schools, there's a pattern, which is that those who live near the schools that are closing have to go farther to go to an alternate school. And who are those folks? They are disproportionately persons of color who are already disadvantaged. So what can we do? Uh, I mean, obviously zoning reform is a good start, but it needs to go a lot deeper than that. We need I to see. scrutinize everything because what's happening in housing is just one more manifestation of a much deeper structural issue. All right, thank you. Um, you know, I, I, I won't take much time to editorialize, but I'm sorry that that has been your experience. Thank you for sharing that. Let's, same question, Lily May, and fingers crossed that maybe the audio is a, is a little bit louder than it was the last time. Certainly, well, I will definitely try to project louder. Is it working? Okay, That, that is perfect. That's great. Perfect. Um, so as we learned on early in this pandemic, uh, we as a state were not prepared. And one of the challenges is we need to ensure that we have the infrastructure to support our communities that are at risk, whether it's, to address the needs that we it highlighted in the pandemic, the need to address constant and continued support and reliability. Because if people can't feel comfortable with their rentals or their mortgage evictions, that they will be able to stay in their housing, those supportive services are really critical. I think the other thing that's very important for equity is to provide that access to the resource. That's why I'm very proud of the fact that when it came to rental assistance and so many of these other programs, that we deliberately have involved language outreach and different supportive services to ensure that we are working with our community-based organizations. So when it came to rental assistance, that's why to date in our city, we've delivered over 11 million in rental assistance as of January to over 777 families because we had gone through this experience in the beginning and therefore built the robustness of the infrastructure to deliver that because families who wanna stay housed need to have that reliability in the government's ability to deliver those supportive services, programs, and resources to keep them housed in these challenging times. And that's what we need to do when we go to the state level is to work together collectively with our region and our legislators to ensure the funding and programs that are needed to do so. All right, thank you. Uh, same question, Aisha. Thank you. Uh, you know, the question is specifically about dismantling segregation, uh, central racial equity, and, and uh, basically close the racial wealth gap. You know, the honest truth is that my family is a family of immigrants. Um, they were small business owners. And uh, when the Great Recession took place, their family business, our family business, um, started to tank and our home was foreclosed. Eventually, we were priced out of Fremont and moved to Hayward, uh, the least affluent city in this district. And I really wanna highlight that because the city of Hayward is probably one of the most diverse cities with roughly 40% Latino, 30% Asian, 10% uh, black and, and so much more. Uh, with that said, I have been a staunch advocate for social justice being part of our policy framework. Uh, every policy that we introduce has to have a social justice and racial equity um, point. Specifically, um, I've stood as a pro Black Lives Matter, pro LGBTQIA and pro choice. Um, and that's reflected in my voting record as well as um, the focus that I, I really tackle an issue with. Um, specifically, I will champion low and middle com income um, uh, first time home buyers in particular. Uh, generational wealth is significantly hard to develop. I was the first in Alameda County to introduce an eviction moratorium because of my struggles, because of the fact that I would be the only renter in the state Senate. And with that, I protected not only commercial property um, owners, but also residents. And that is the first step when we protect our foundation of our people and making sure that they keep their asset. Um, that is the most important thing to me, and it will continue to be the most important thing moving forward. All right. Thank you so much. And that actually provides a natural segue to our next question, number five. The pandemic has really shined a light on housing insecurity when society shuts down. And for people that live paycheck to paycheck, that can be very, very disruptive and very scary. 
The sheer number of California residents who are at grave risk of losing their homes is more than we would care to have. Now, in your view, what is the state's role in preventing displacement? And as a state senator, what protections would you propose and support to ensure that housing stability for all Californians? Why don't we go ahead and start with Mr. Cobb? Sure. Uh, so there's a lot of fear among renters of an eviction tsunami. So during the pandemic, landlords were generally prohibited from displacing tenants for failing to pay rent during the pandemic as long as tenants applied to the state or another government program for aid. And a lot of them did apply for these kinds of programs, and that gave them protection. So even if they were served with an eviction notice, the state renter protections allowed them to not be displaced. But those protections are due to expire soon. And there's a new bill that could help them out and give them an extension. Uh, the state program, it's called Housing is Key. It's been flooded with so many applications that over half of the applicants are still waiting for their files to be reviewed. Uh, the new bill, it's something that we would be the fourth extension of eviction protections, and it would uh, extend it to, I think, June 30th, uh, but only for tenants with active applications. Uh, and I support that because if we can do it for student loan repayments, we can also do it for something that's far more crucial, like a roof over someone's head. But that still leaves millions of other tenants who are not covered under the new bill who could be facing potential eviction, right? So we need legislation that addresses what we can do for those folks as well. Uh, we also have you know, folks who have applied. They say the process is very complex. Uh, for those who have English as a second language, uh, you know, it's very difficult for them to navigate it. So it's going to take a lot of political will to make a difference here and to like, reach everyone who needs help. Uh, but I will fight very hard to prevent evictions. All right, perfect. That is time. Lily May. Same sure. I, thank you. So the same question. Um, yesterday, the Senate Judicial Committee approved uh, AB 2179, which I think is what uh, uh, Jamal uh, Kennedy Khan was referencing, which is to provide judicial eviction protections to tenants um, with requests already pending and to allow them the extension. And this is something that we've looked at and something as a Senator with fellow colleagues, you'd be able to write letters and ask for that support. But some of the things that we could also do in the next steps, as we mentioned earlier, is talking about ways that we can help support the financing. Going through these different processes, I've noticed how difficult it is sometimes for the communities at color and also to provide the resources for the banks to provide that lending. So encouraging them at a, with the financial institutions from the smallest to the largest lenders to look more at a greater degree of investing in people of color and to underserved areas and communities. So you can create programs that help support and help foster those and not just give unmanded, unfunded mandates to businesses, but to work in concert with businesses as well as the communities to look at ways that we can bridge those resources. The other program I'm very proud of is to help in these times is to come up with programs to help with workforce development and upskilling. One of our programs, Earn and Learn Fremont allowed us to take people who were at risk, put them in jobs that were needed in a city with 900 manufacturers to help upskill them and give them the training that they needed to provide them not just a job for that moment, but for skills that could help them carry on moving forward and help provide future upwards economic mobility for them and their families. All right, Aisha, same question. Thank you. Um, you know, my family experienced the foreclosure crisis as millions of Americans also did. Um, I always say that banks were bailed out twice. They got the federal bank, um, uh, the federal bailout, I should say, and uh, kept the assets of millions of Americans. It's not about having them focus and invest in uh, people of color. It's specifically about writing clear policy that specifically dictate that individuals of low income backgrounds and uh, marginalized communities are prioritized. And that is why I, in Hayward, as well as hopefully in the state Senate, I'm able to push a policy that says uh, priority preference to local residents. Um, as much as we care about making sure that, you know, housing is affordable and so forth, but we don't want to displace people. Um, in particular, our homeless population in the state of California is 50% of the entire nation's um, homeless population. With that, every think tank out there states that our senior homeless population is expected to more than double, but nearly triple in the next decade alone. So for me, it is about making sure that, you know, the big banks and the corporate landlords um, have endless experience with the fact that um, how to outmaneuver renters, how to outmaneuver first time um, homeowners and so much more. We need to prioritize them and their rights first and foremost, 
um, making sure that we are protecting our seniors, our disabled, and specifically also women and women of color. Um, I do believe that the mere fact that we can rent a car or lease a car or buy a car and have stability in our payments versus our housing being instable, um, specifically month to month or even yearly, it's a crime in itself. So I really want to focus on our foundation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, Jim, same question. Yeah, and I like uh, Lily brought up uh, career tech, and I actually served in the Metro Ed governing board for over 15 years. I've gone to Sacramento so many times I can't count it in terms of lobbying for expanding funding for career tech. And I absolutely am in agreement on that point. Um, when we have families that are suffering economic challenges, we have a fabulous CTE system throughout the state that we can plug those families into. And, and the goal here is we, we want them to thrive. We want families to be able to afford to be here and to thrive. And our CTE system can really accomplish that for a lot of our citizens. Uh, when it comes to the whole issue of, you know, what cities and local government has done in terms of, uh, you know, eviction moratoriums and rent controls, these are all short-term things. They, they cannot go on forever. These are Band-Aid approaches. Uh, helpful, obviously, when you need a Band-Aid, you need a Band-Aid. But we need to think beyond that. We need to fix the problem, which goes back to my notion of a housing voucher. A housing voucher would help fix the problem, stabilize people in the homes they have, and for those who want to, to move into home ownership, which is critical. We have to clear the pathway for our citizens to get to home ownership because renting is fundamentally insecure. We, you know, we've painted this picture, and I have eight seconds left, of some future where we're renting from cradle to grave. That's unacceptable. All right, thank you for all of your time. Uh, we're moving to the sixth and the last question of this, of this portion of our forum. So the question is, homelessness is one of the biggest challenges faced by Californians. In January of 2019, 27% of people experiencing homelessness in the, in the entire United States were in California with 72% of them unsheltered. It's the highest of any state. It's actually a, a staggering statistic. This is a deep problem. It requires thoughtful, deliberate, and urgent action. What do you think the state's priority should be in ending homelessness? And this time, let's begin with Lily. Well, I think that there's a need to look at this in terms of low-hanging fruit and scale out. It's really a multi-prong approach, and we need to look at ways that we can, in order to challenge these um, issues that in terms of addressing them. In our city, we've done things like warming centers. I know Hayward and other surrounding cities have implemented these too, as well as safe parking housing navigation centers, which are key in terms of being able to pe give people the resources and programs and supportive services that allow people to be able to transition from short-term housing to longer-term solutions. But we also talked about things like safe parking, and working with our faith-based communities. And then more importantly, in terms of providing educational opportunities for economic mobility, which is the key to preventing homelessness in the first place. If we are able to provide a stable resource and programs, and also the different types of housing that are affordable, whether it's different types of models of housing. Here, one of the things I'm very proud of is we have 500 units of senior housing. And one of the first pieces that we built was the low income senior housing which is one way to address those needs. The other thing that we talked about earlier was our um, Habitat for Humanity project. And because there was a challenge from the first phase of low to very low to workforce development housing, we were able to use our cap and trade funding. And we were one of the first projects in the state of California to use that to build that missing middle, the workforce housing. So it's working collectively with the state federal and also our business entities and more importantly, the community to find out what types of solutions will work and to be able to customize and partner those with our fellow legislators and each of those surrounding communities. All right. And Lily, the technical gremlin of the audio crept up again. You were audible, but it was low again. It was perfect last time. And then it reverted back. It was just a little bit low this last time. Same, qu same, same question uh, to Aisha. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I 
really want to prioritize who we we try to focus on again um you know we're we're hearing a lot of different things but uh th the reality is this in alameda county alone we have roughly more than eight thousand homeless individuals and roughly thirty thousand vacant units we don't have a housing problem in that regard we have an affordability crisis right in many santa clara county cities for the, the average rent of a two bedroom one must earn about sixty dollars an hour we have an economic crisis. These are all rolling into each other. When we talk about our unhoused individuals, less than 3% actually refuse any support. Um, the majority are looking for a better paying job as well as an affordable unit, which in the Bay Area, we do not have because we are not holding our assets at, you know, with a lot of um, value. Specifically, we need to protect single family homes duplexes, condos, townhomes, and many other units from the speculative market. And that means holding other folks accountable, specifically corporate landlords, corporations that are purchasing up the homes. Our technology is moving at a speed of light, whereas our policies are still behind the times. When you have companies like Zillow just mass purchase all the low um, or affordable housing on the market, that's a problem. That is unhousing people like myself. That is causing a bigger problem than we need, and we need to start with keeping people housed first, as well as providing wraparound services for job placement, education, mental health, and so much more. Our homeless crisis is bigger than just a house. All right, thank you. Same question, Jim. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to kind of focus our attention on Gover Governor Newsom and his efforts with the uh, Community Assistance Recovery and Empowerment Court and, uh, you know, its aim is to empower Californians in crisis to access housing, treatment, and care. And there's a lot of debate around that because um, there was a time in our state many decades ago where when people were suffering various types of mental illness, um, they would receive treatment. However, the record of the treatment that they received is very checkered. Um, and so there's always been a problem <laughs> with trying to bring treatment to those that are homeless um, and needing mental treatment. Uh, not everyone who is homeless is in need of that. Uh, man, many people who are homeless is economic disruption. And we've talked already about how to, to, to use things like the navigation centers that many cities have employed, uh, hooking these people up to things like the career tech pathways that we have, <laughs> get people back on their feet and back into a productive life. Um, and, and so I think when we talk about the homeless issue, we have to look at at least those two components, the economic disruption, and then also those who really do need treatment. And how do we do that treatment and not make the mistakes of the past? Because there was a time uh, in the state's history where that treatment was available. But as I say, that history is a very checkered history. All right, thank you so much. Now, Lily, your camera is off, but it appears that your microphone is on. Yes, so I was trying to fix and fix some of the volume problems. Well, we hear we hear you loud and clear now, but uh, okay, that's why I was to, trying to figure out to, how to toggle some of that right now. Yeah, there was there may there may be someone else on here who is not on mute because we heard a little bit of coughing in Jim's answer, but we could still we could still make out everything that he was saying. So. We'll move on. Same question to Mr. Khan. Okay, so Santa Clara County did a survey of the homeless population. And what they found was that two thirds of the population, they are working, they do have jobs. But what happens is that the their rent uh, rose so high, it outstripped their ability to pay it, or they were working two jobs, they got laid off from one of those jobs. And then the next thing they knew they were living in their car, or living in an RV. Uh, and those are the folks who actually tried to try to hide the fact that they're homeless, sort of like Will Smith in the movie, The Pursuit of Happiness. By the way, speaking of Will Smith, I don't know what happened at the Oscars on Sunday. Yeah, very disappointing. But anyway, so that's two thirds of the homeless population. Now the remaining one third are the ones who are more visibly homeless. They're the ones who, and for them, it's, it's something where there's a deeper issue that's going on. Uh, it's either a mental health issue or a substance abuse issue, or both. And that deeper issue needs to be addressed for, the, for any difference to be made. Because it's one thing to just, yeah, to, yeah, like whatever money is being spent on them, 
you know, that's not going to solve that deeper underlying issue. Any help that's given to them has to be coupled with mandatory mental health counseling and or addiction treatment. Uh, uh, that 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 has to be there as a mandate because you know I worked on the opioid crisis for the Obama White House. I wrote a book about the opioid crisis called American Opioid. There is medication assisted treatment. There is harm reduction. There are so many things that can be done to help these folks who are struggling with addiction. Uh, and so that's something we need. That's the kind of approach we need to take uh, when it comes to mental health. Uh, you know, we it's you know as Jim was mentioning, you know, we just haven't. Uh, done enough uh, in that area. I mean, so that is going to require a huge uh, investment in resources, uh, but that'll be much better than what we're doing right now, which is, you know, which is just throwing money down the drain in a lot of cases. And so I mean, that's very time. important. And okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I, le I let you go hoping that, uh, that you were, that you were landing the plane, but uh, we're, we're going to try and keep it on schedule uh, this evening. So that, that actually uh, wraps up the longer Q&A portion, and we're gonna to move to the rapid fire part now. And I think what might be helpful for this to kind of just speed it along, why don't we have all of the candidates go ahead and unmute themselves because this is really sort of one word answers, yes, no, maybe the briefest of explanations, but really yes, no, maybe is, is kind of what is preferred for this part. So let's go ahead and start with the first one in our rapid fire question segment. So the first one is, would you support a statewide ballot measure for more affordable housing funding? Jim, yes or no? Yeah, yes. Jamal. Yes, absolutely. Lily. But it depends on the verbiage. Okay, that's a maybe, all right. And Ayusha. Yes, and it also needs to include middle income housing. Okay. Would you defend, number two, would you defend the state's role in setting minimum standards for land use and zoning? Aisha. Uh, yes, but all cities uh, need to update their housing element and removal of segregation and discriminatory language in that as well. Lily. Yes, the cur state currently is doing that and we do update our housing elements and we look at those we use. And Jamal. Yes, everything that's constitutionally permissible. And Jim. Yes, as I alluded to earlier, we need better integration between the state and the local governments. So yes. Okay. Number three, recent legislation has made it easier to develop accessory dwelling units, often known as granny units, but some challenges still remain. Would you support legislation that makes it easier to develop those kinds of units? Let's go ahead and start with Jamal. Yes, this is an important part of my platform. Lily. Yes, that's why our city and many other cities have created ADU playbooks to help the local business, the local municipalities be able to approve those quicker. Okay, and Aisha? Yes, I'd like to continue the work of Senator Wykowski, who has also endorsed our campaign. And Jim? Yes, I agree. Senator Wykowski deserves credit because this is really something he pioneered, and absolutely, I would support it. Okay. All right, number four, would you support legislation that makes it easier to create middle density housing like fourplexes and eightplexes? Let's go ahead and start with Lily. Yes. And Aisha? Yes, with protections for current residents and a focus on affordability and parking and traffic considerations. Uh, focus can't just be on rental units, but also ownership. And Jim? Yes, and, and I will agree, ownership, ownership, ownership. Uh, the, there's an old saying, the best way to fire your landlord is to buy your home. And Jamal? Uh, yes, uh, to a reasonable degree, yes. Okay, last one for the rapid fire, and you guys are really keeping with the spirit of this, so I appreciate that. Would you support legislation to require cities to allow higher density housing near public transportation and jobs to reduce um, urban sprawl and car dependency? Aisha? Yes, but realistic plans must be considered. Investment in transportation and infrastructure are needed. Policy and practice are two very different things, and it's already happening, but there's a lot of problems with it. And Lily? Yes, we already have transit-oriented development, and a key example is our Warm Springs District, but it's important that we have the balance of the community benefits, such as schools and infrastructure that provide that maintaining the quality of life. All right, and Jamal? Uh, yes, this I, I described this at length uh, on my policy platform on my website. Okay, and Jim? Yeah, a qualified yes. Um, my, my concerns are that uh, we, this conversation still has a very pre-pandemic feel. 
and the pandemic has changed things. A, a quick little insert is BART did a survey about how soon they think they'll get back to ridership pre-pandemic. And, and they had a lot of data points, uh, a very good report, and they see it being a decade. 10 years before they get to those pre-pandemic levels. So yes, but it needs to take into account the, how the world has changed, the way we work, the way we educate. We're using public transportation less, we're using our cars less. It's a different world. All right, thanks. Thank you, all of you. So we're done with the Q&A part. We will conclude with candidate statements. We're gonna go ahead and go in reverse order from the intro. So we'll begin with, and, and everyone except the person that's that's going to be speaking, go ahead and mute yourself. We'll start with Aisha and work backwards. Definitely. Uh, well, thank you for this opportunity. I'm hoping to earn your vote for state Senate. Uh, housing has been my number one issue and will continue to be the number one issue on top of economic inequality. Uh, I'll make sure our policies are fair, balanced and expedient. Um, join the California Democratic Party, Planned Parenthood, California Environmental Voters, and many local Democratic clubs in voting You know, for myself, Aisha Wahab, for State Senate. I genuinely appreciate the time, and I'm happy to answer any further questions at 510-863-1545. Thank you. All right, and uh, Lily, you're next. Thank you again for all the time that was put aside this evening and for those who came to listen to us. What I want to encourage people is this moment of negativity and we talk about the needs for us to work together, for us to collaboratively agree that we want to have positive campaigning because what we need to do for our community right now is to serve the people and it should be people over politics. And that's what I pledge to you is that my life valued best by serving the community and delivering the products and services and resources that our community and our state needs to build back a better future. All right, thank you. And uh, Jamal, it's your turn. Uh, one of my mentors in DC said that if you talk about your concerns to uh, an elected official's office, they will listen. And if you have money behind you, you can speak louder. And if you have votes behind you, you can speak even louder than that. And on the issue of affordable housing, we've reached the point where votes matter more than money. I am determined to be the most accessible candidate in this race. No gatekeepers. Anyone who wants to talk to me can talk to me. If you have any questions about what I've said in this forum, my personal cell phone number is 408-834-6991. You can also find my phone number on my campaign website, votecon.com. Thank you, and I look forward to continuing the conversation. All right, Jim, you've got the last word tonight, or at least thank for you. the candidates. And, and thank you, Devin. This has been really awesome. Thank you. President John F. Kennedy said, let us not seek the Republican answer or the Democratic answer, but the right answer. Let us not seek to fix the blame for the past. Let us accept our own responsibility for the future. Building a new California dream for California's families requires that we break free from the paralyzing partisanship of the past. My name is Jim Canova, and I'm running for the state Senate. I'm asking for your vote on June 7th so that we can start building our new California dream together on November 8th. All right. Well, this that concludes the candidate portion of the forum. I want to thank all of the candidates who very generously gave up their time this evening. I want to thank them for their thoughtful answers to difficult questions. And I really want to thank them for the, the spirit of civility and respect with which they've conducted themselves during this forum. Recordings of tonight's forum will be posted to the SV at Home Action Fund's YouTube page. And before we say goodnight, Regina Celestin Williams, the executive director of both the SV at Home and SV at Home Action Fund, she's got some words for us before we wrap things up. Well, thank you so much, Devin. I really appreciate um, your time and your skills and um, your beautiful moderation of the conversation tonight. Um, we're putting up a very simple three question poll and we'd like you all to participate um, uh, and fill it out. We hope this forum was, has been helped you learn about housing issues and the candidates and helped you be more informed as a voter. And I just wanna say thank you again to our moderator. Um, I wanna say thank you to our interpreters and I absolutely wanna thank our candidates for um, being open and honest um, and answering 
our questions fully and, and really focusing in on the topic of housing and homelessness um, in our region. So I appreciate all of you. Thank you to all of our co-hosts uh, working in and for the community, helping us reach more voters on such critical issues. So thank you for, for spreading the word about this event tonight. Tonight was the first in our series of five forums this spring. So we invite you to come to our other forums as well to hear from candidates from other local races. So uh, with that, I just wanna say again, I appreciate you all for joining us tonight, sharing this space with us and doing so very respectfully. Thank you and have a wonderful evening.